Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, glad you joined us today. And, and uh, here's what we're going to do today. This is a webinar on email marketing and the, the 10 best practices and how to get the most out of your campaigns. So, you know, at the core of marketing is the idea that it's intended to elicit a physical or measurable response. You don't just create and send newsletters or post updates or solicit feedback or plan events. Uh, without expecting some sort of an objective in mind or some goal that your campaign is intended to achieve. And we often refer to that call to action as a part of your communication. It's the request for someone to join your mailing list or to visit your store, to sign up for your annual fundraising gala, because really at the end of the day, that's what marketing is all about. It's about getting someone with whom you your business or your organization has a relationship with to take an action that will help your organization to succeed. Now, this isn't intended to educate about specific goals and objectives. We have other webinars, other sessions for that. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is marketing campaigns, those collections of marketing activities that make up an effort that's intended to drive an action that leads to a specific goal. And specifically, we'll be focusing on newsletters and announcements and their close cousin, social engagement. And simply put, these activities are primarily about communication and about connecting with your readers. But that doesn't mean they aren't also a great way to drive action. And today we're going to talk about how you can deliver the most effective newsletters possible. So this uh, seminar is called Campaigns That Drive Action, Newsletters and Announcements. Uh, here is my contact information. Uh, that you're on this webinar means that you will get a copy of all of the information that you see on screen, including this contact information. And really what I want you to see here is a couple of things. One is the Countess Group Marketing and Communications mm -hmm. is a communications and marketing consultancy. We handle all aspects of marketing and communication for businesses for profit and not for profit. Uh, we are also certified, master certified constant contact providers. Uh, we're authorized experts on behalf of the company. And also, I'm a Microsoft partner and a Google partner as well. So if you have questions at any time along the way, either now or after the webinar, go ahead and post the questions to us, give us a call, send us an email, check us out on the web, and uh, we'll help you solve your marketing problems and opportunities. A little bit about my personal background. I spent 25 years in corporate America at names such as Motorola, Marriott, CVS, Caremark, and Datamax O'Neill. And uh, full-time for the last four years uh, have been a consultant. I've been consulting. Uh, we're now in our 14th year. And uh, so these are some of the clients we've served. The better-known name logos are uh, pictured on your screen. They include Verizon and Marriott and uh, Alcatel-Lucent and Tampa Airport and the University of Central Florida's College of Medicine. But mostly we're focused on businesses and nonprofits like yours dozens if not hundreds at this point of small to medium sized businesses and nonprofits. Uh, what I'd like you to know, and, and I know during the registration process we asked whether you're currently using Constant Contact, and uh, many of you are. For those who are not, or for those who have not explored the other Constant Contact offerings, in addition to newsletters and announcements, there are other products that are right there in your account enabling you to uh, provide offers and promotions, to take surveys. Uh, perhaps you want to know what your customers or donors or volunteers are thinking about. And maybe also uh, handling events and registrations. When you signed up for today's webinar, you are actually using Constant Contact's Event Spot event and registration product, uh, which gives me and would give you, should you be using it, an opportunity to not only know what, uh, what your customers are thinking if you're using the survey product, but also to get a great handle on the number of registrations. And if this were a uh, paid event, you could also collect payment in advance, uh, which is a terrific opportunity for you. So here's what we're going to do today. 
we're going to review exactly what a campaign is, and we'll make sure we're all on the same page in understanding what we mean when we say newsletter. We'll talk about email and provide you with some tried and true uh, tips for effective email marketing. We'll make the connection between email and social media because they really have become inseparable. And then we'll talk at length about social media, specifically what you should be thinking about if you're starting to build your social media presence. We'll give you some insight into the big networks and how to think about what to say on social media. And finally, we'll talk about next steps that you can take. I also want to make a quick, quick note about for and nonprofits and industry verticals. I'm often asked about the things I'm talking about, you know, whether they should be adjusted or changed for a nonprofit or services like a business to business firm or someone in a different industry vertical. I hear things like, I'm not a brick and mortar business, so how does this apply to me? The good news is that the principles that we're going to cover are largely universal. They can benefit a nonprofit just as much as they can a for profit. A business to business business can follow these just as readily as a business to consumer business, and a restaurant can succeed with these ideas just as readily as a yoga studio or a church or a bookstore. So you may have different considerations to make for your select audiences, but in large part, what we're teaching here are best practices, and they are best practices across the board. Let me reveal some surprising facts to you. Uh, here's a study that was done by the Content Marketing Institute. They reviewed things like uh, newsletters and how they're used, and what they found is something that's probably not all that surprising to you, that usage of email marketing across the board is 80% or higher, with the one minor exception of business to consumer in North America, and that's just a shade below 80%. But just as important is they all rate email marketing to be incredibly effective. Here's a study that was done recently by a company called Exact Target. They study sales channel preferences. And what those sales channel preferences said was that of all the marketing tools out there for business, and nonprofit that 77% of consumers prefer to be marketed to via email marketing. Now that's important to recognize. The reason is that we are all addicted to email marketing. Using that slide bar down at the bottom of your screen, if you've checked your email at least once today, go ahead and slide that temperature thermometer all the way to the right. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, we are truly addicted to marketing. The simple fact is that uh, we check email marketing on average four and more times a day. And most of the time these days, it's on a smartphone or tablet or iPad or something like that as well. So this 77% of consumers preferring to be marketed to via email marketing, that is as opposed to things like print and outdoor advertising and radio, broadcast TV, and so on. Take a look at this as well. Here's what a recent article in Forbes said. The article said that customer acquisition via email has more than quadrupled in the last four years. Now, what's significant about that is the following. Facebook is over 10 years old. LinkedIn is over 10 years old. Twitter is eight years old. Pinterest is four years old. And we hear about Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, and so on all the time. And yet, customer acquisition via email has more than quadrupled in the last four years, despite all the popularity of the social media channels. And customers who come to businesses via email tend to shop more and spend more. Okay, here's another thing you need to know. And by the way, all of this data is noted in the sources. You'll generally find them at the bottom of the screen. And again, you'll get a copy of all of these slides so you can go check the data out yourself. Email marketing has a return on investment of over 43 to 1. So what that means is if you spend 20 bucks for an email marketing subscription, and by the way, with all of these services, there's no contract, so you could try it out. And if you decide you don't like it, then you just stop your subscription. But this is what 20 bucks a month looks like and a 43 to one return on investment. 
if you spend a hundred dollars, you get forty three hundred back. That's pretty powerful. Okay, let's talk about campaigns and newsletters. I want to give you a simple definition or a framework for what marketing really is. I mean, you already know generally what it is, but when I say the word marketing, I mean something very specific. And it's very important that we're all on the same page here. My definition of marketing has three simple parts. You define an audience, a group of people you want to target. You reach out to them with a message that's specific to that audience. And then you seek to elicit a physical measurable response. Now that may be a click, a reply, a call, a purchase, a referral. These are all actions that represent a decision made by a human to react to your message. And keep this in mind as we discuss marketing and marketing campaigns and ways to deliver the most effective campaigns. You're doing these things because you want people, your customers, your donors or supporters to do something. So first let's talk about campaigns and what does that word really mean? Well, very simply, there are two parts to a campaign. The first is you push out some sort of content. And we'll talk more about what content in a bit to your followers and supporters and so on. And second, you hope to uh, pull some sort of a response from them. You want them to read or forward or share what you sent, show up, call, attend. You want them to take an action of some sort. Think about a campaign in terms of push-pull. And more importantly, don't think about it as just putting an offer out there and making the sale. In this new marketing world, it's more like a conversation, which lends itself to that advantage we talked about that you have over big business. As a small company, you can engage in a conversation that feels and, in fact, is much less like a sales gimmick and more like nurturing a relationship. And if you're doing it right, it will seem like that from both sides of the conversation. You know, for many small businesses, a newsletter is very, very important. You know, we're all small business owners on this call, or we're all working for a nonprofit, large or small, and we have an opportunity to really distinguish ourselves from the big box retailers and super big nonprofits and so on, because we can inject personality into our marketing campaigns. And in that newsletter, the newsletter is really a communication you send, usually through email, to your customers, supporters, clients, volunteers, sharing information and relevant insights that they want to read. And they know you and you know them. That makes it really simple. So there are different kinds of communications loosely referred to as newsletters that you might send. And these are just a few examples, from sending a quick update to just keeping your audience informed to a simple card or announcement all the way to what we call a custom code email, where you or a designer perhaps that you work with creates your own email in a standard platform, but using your own custom code. So what are these best practices? Well, best practice number one is this. Simply demonstrate your expertise. What do you write about in your newsletter? You know, that's where people tend to have the biggest hurdles that they have to jump. And, and quite honestly, luckily, the answer can be very simple. First and above all else, you write about what you know that they don't know. You share your knowledge or raise your profile as an expert in your field. If you are in real estate, there's an awful lot that you know about real estate, real estate trends, pricing, vacancies if it's a commercial property. You know a lot of things that your audience doesn't know. And next, you may have access to information that your audience doesn't have access to. And you may have more access than you think. This can mean that you allow them to download a special report you have access to. Or give your audience backstage passes or early registration or reserve their special seating to an event or maybe provide an extra hour of your time when they pay for two and give it away when you can. And really what you're trying to do is build what's called a resource relationship where when their need for what you do comes up, you're the person that comes to mind. Give it away, your knowledge and your success when you can. 
you're only scratching the surface of all of the service possibilities you have. You truly are valuable to your reader, and original isn't required. You really don't have to be prolific writing original material every time. You just need to be the hub or the point of access. So you can send links to other sources. Know your stuff, and your audience will see you as their key resource. Okay, best practice number two is the length of your newsletter. Does anybody here like to receive a really long email? If you do, slide that temperature bar over to the right. If you don't like receiving long emails, slide that temperature bar to the left. Yeah, there isn't anybody that likes to receive a really long email. In fact, in all the seminars that I've done, and I do about 80 of these every year, no one has ever raised their hand that they really like a long email. If you're a church or a chamber of commerce or a school, you probably do have long emails, and we're okay with getting those because there's something that we're highly interested in. We have an, It's an affinity group, if you will. Our children and our businesses rely on you, and we want to see activity. We're willing to get a long email from a school, but we generally don't read them all the way down to the bottom. It's okay that we see them, though. In fact, 78% of people don't scroll down to the bottom of an email. So take the pressure to create or write off of yourself. Always, 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 less is more. And there's no rule that says your newsletter has to have three articles or three pictures and three links. One thing is plenty. I've got a client whose newsletter each month only has one image and one paragraph. He does that to make it really easy on himself, and it works really well. People can absorb it, and he's not under the gun to come up with a bunch of content to fill the newsletter. So stay focused. And one other thing, don't forget that over 50% of people today are reading an email on a mobile device. So who is going to scroll through 14 different articles? Your emails and their social media activities are not for telling people everything that you do. That's part of the whole people dig for themselves when they start writing emails. They try to say everything. And that's not what your emails and social media posts are for. That's what your website is for. Your emails and your social media is about offering one thing at a time and tracking whether or not it moved the needle, plain and simple. Best practice number three, how do you use images? Well, here are some examples of what others are doing. And these are some examples of uh, actual newsletters from constant contact users. These are easy to absorb, obvious actions to take, Nonprofits, for profits, here's a restaurant sharing their uh, current specials, um, uh, an event notice in the lower right hand corner. Uh, pictures are worth what? A thousand words. Pictures get 47% more click through activity than content without images. But make sure that you do not over rely on images. Be sure to use text labels in case images are not displayed by the recipient's mail program. And don't use images of your content. In other words, don't take an image and put text over it. Save it as an image and, and expect that your readers are necessarily going to see the text because if their images aren't activated, they will never see the text. And remember again that your content is viewed on mobile devices. You've really got to use images carefully. Images are a great way to convey a message, tell a story, create a connection. But if you don't carefully consider how to use images, you may wind up with some unintended consequences that lead, at best, to someone not reading your email. And at worst, they'll unsubscribe from your list and you won't be able to communicate with them at all. And here are some common challenges to consider. You see the red X on the uh, left one? Um, that's because some mobile email clients may not display images by default. So be sure that you're using what's called alt text or text that appears if the image doesn't. So at least let people know what's there. In the middle one, it's a great picture. The promotional posts are used for a fundraiser. And when you look at it on a desktop email client, it may look great. But the problem is on a mobile device, in order to see it, 
or see the rest of the message, the reader has to scroll through the message, and the image has pushed a call to action all the way down to the bottom of the message, making it much less likely that the reader will actually click through. And finally, be aware of how or where an image may appear. You may need to resize images as you build your email. The best thing is before you send an email out to your customers or supporters, test the email by sending it to yourself. Images really are great because they can help you tell your story across multiple channels. And here are a few examples of how images are used across different social media platforms in addition to email. Best practice number four, repurpose and reuse. Make life easy on yourself. You can think about social media, and we'll talk a little bit more about it a little bit later on, but what I want you to keep in mind at this point is that whatever you use in your newsletter is perfect content to use in social media as well. And that, what that means is you can reuse and repurpose everything. One article can be used many times on various channels. So let's say, for example, you might send a newsletter with five tips for cleaning out your closet, and each tip can be tweeted once a day for a week. Best practice number five, how do you get your newsletter open? Does anybody have that kind of a challenge? Use the temperature bar. If you're wondering and want to know how to get your email opened, move that temperature bar all the way to the right. Now that you have a good idea of what you want to try to put in the newsletter, I want to give you some insight into what works. How to get more people to stop and actually open up your email. How to have them consider your offer. And how to get more physical, measurable response. And this is one of my favorite parts of this seminar. You know, take a look at these three words. It's now, later, and never. Those are three little words that can rule your world. Now, later, and never. And think about this morning when you were checking your email, whether you were aware of it or not, you were sorting your messages into these three categories automatically, now, later, and never. So how do you get that email opened? Well, there are three fundamental factors that uh, determine whether someone's going to open up your email right now. The first is, who is it from? 68% of us decide whether to open up an email when we first see it based on who it's from. Think about when you checked your email for the first time today and you took a look at your inbox, you probably did a mental scan. You looked at that from column and said, okay, which ones are coming from my friends, my family, or my company? Those got open first. The next thing you look at is what's the subject line? 38% determine whether to open up an email right away based on the subject. And then there's the timing. When do you send your communication? Those are the three major factors that influence whether you're going to open up an email right now. So how do you win this battle of priorities and get more people to stop and open your email or stop and read your Facebook post or tweet or to share your pin on Pinterest? Well, it turns out who the message or offer is from is extremely important. And think about how you sort your email, or if you're on Facebook, think about the news feed. Again, typically when you open up your email and think about this morning, you start at the top of the list and go down, sorting by who it's from. Who the email or social media post comes from turns out to be the most important part of winning the battle of priorities. You do it based on who, so it's important for you to be recognizable and to be recognized across all of the channels that you're using. So if you send your emails using your name, but your Facebook page shows up in people's news feeds as your business name, people may not make the connection. And we do know that with email, and very often with social media sites, more people react to a person's name than to a business name. So just be sure that you're consistent with the name that you use and ensure that it's the one that you'll be most recognized by so that ultimately your readers and followers will stop and open your email and read your posts 
because they know they're going to get something of value and relevance to you. And there are some important considerations, too, that shouldn't be overlooked, and they relate to something called the Can Spam Act, which is a law that sets the rules for commercial email and establishes requirements for commercial messages and gives recipients the right to have you stop emailing them and spells out tough penalties for violations. The law does not make an exception for business-to-business -business email, and that means that all email, for example, a message to former customers announcing a new product line, must comply with the law. Templates make the process of sending emails so much easier while still allowing you to preserve the look and feel of your brand. Here are a couple of examples of templates from Constant Contact, and you can see the left two are from the same organization. The problem with the one on the left is if you're looking at it on a mobile device, that image at the top takes up too much room, and you don't see a call to action, where the one in the middle, nice, clean look, but the call to action is right there near the top. And basically what it says is, we're open for lunch, come on in. And if you're a nonprofit, the one on the right may have high relevance for you. Again, keep the imagery simple, keep the look clean, use a nice size font so it's easy to see when you're looking at it on a mobile device, and keep that call to action highly visible because it's not about getting your email open. It's about getting people to react with your email. So how do you win this battle of priorities? Basically, you've got two seconds. You've got to get that call to action or that sense of urgency done in the first two words of your subject line. So someone will open up that email today. We call this the 222 principle. So what does that look like in practice? Well, take a look at these examples. If you were looking at an email that the subject was March newsletter, you're probably not very compelled to open that email right away. If, on the other hand, if it had an action-based word, a call to action, tomorrow need three hammers, you're much more likely to pay attention to that email. Joe's Pet Store newsletter is probably not going to get a very high open rate, but alert, help your dog beat the heat, especially uh, here in the summertime, is probably going to help Joe get your newsletter open. Children's classes, again, not terribly exciting, but still time, openings available. That creates a sense of urgency. The last piece in winning the battle of priorities is timing. When to send is another very common question I get, both for how often to send and also when in terms of time of day and day of the week. For newsletters and email marketing frequency, monthly is the most common. But it's also a good idea to add unexpected messages every once in a while, especially if they relate to an exciting announcement about your organization. If you're already on my email marketing newsletter list, then you know you get one newsletter a month from me. That's it unless there's a special announcement. Maybe there's a special seminar that we're going to run or a webinar like that, this one, so that we may send out a special newsletter, but it's only very infrequently. So what you really need to do is to ask yourself, when are my readers most likely to take the action I want them to take? And before I go any further, I have a quick suggestion uh, for those of you in the audience who are either not yet using email or you're pretty new to the email newsletter concept, uh, sending it out to a list of customers, clients, or donors, what I'm going to describe may seem a little bit advanced, so don't worry about trying to do exactly these steps. Until you get more comfortable with your efforts, just simply focus on the open rates for now and then try different days of the week. But for example, if in one month you send on a Tuesday, you, the next month you could try a Wednesday. If you have used email marketing and you're familiar with how it all works, here's a way to find your best day. Divide your group into, your list rather, into three groups of people. So let's say, for example, your email list is 300 people. Divide it into group A, group B, and group C. Group of 100, another group of 100, and another group of 100 and select three days in the week to test 
and then send your email out on each of those three days and then watch for your best response. Then, once you know the best day, find your best time. And again, this varies for different industries. Use those same three groups of people and then select three times on the day that got you the best results and then send the email out at those three different times of the day and note the time of day that got you the best results. And then you have a good sense of when to send or when to post. But I want you not to be romanced by a high open rate. What I really want you to do is measure actions. And those actions look something like this. Uh, here's an example of an email that uh, was sent out. And these are actual results 18 hours after the send went out. And what you see here is 467 opens. That's 26% open rate, and almost 30% of the people opening up the email clicked on something inside that email. And that's very, very valuable, very, very valuable information for you. So best practice number six, then, is acting on the results. And what you see here is the bar graph, the email statistics that you'll see when you open up your account and take a look at the results from your most recent sends. And what you're looking at here is a solid green line that represents the percentage of people who opened up the email. And the dotted blue line going across the page is the industry average for my industry. And you can see that in this example, my open rate is far above the industry average. If you need help getting better open results, contact me, and I'll be glad to give you some tips on how to improve your open rates. The orange jagged line, the solid line going up and down across the screen, that's an, that is my click-through rate, and as you can see, in every example except for one, we were above the industry average. The industry average is represented by the dotted red line going across the screen. Again, if you're looking for help improving your click-through rate, and this is the, the thing that gets your cash register to ring, uh, contact me after the webinar. Here's an example of an actual email that was sent out on a Tuesday morning, several hours before I did a uh, seminar at a workshop in Orlando uh, for the Material Handlers Conference. Th again, this email was sent out at 7 o'clock in the morning, and one hour later, 18 people that received the email, uh, eight of those actually opened up the email. That's a 47% open rate. The great news is that if you click on any blue number in brackets or any blue number without brackets, you'll know exactly who opened up, who received, who clicked on information inside your email. And that's very, very powerful information because those are warm leads. Those are the people that you should be paying attention to. And if they have not emailed you back or given you a call, or gone to your website and click the Contact Us link, that's an open opportunity for you to reach out to them because you already know that they found high value in information that they received from you. Okay, best practice number seven, several important tips here. Um, the first is that 67% of people do not see images by default, which means that you need to put text links in to make sure that people understand what images they're missing if they don't activate the images. You need to know, too, that text links get more clicks than buttons. Always place your logo left or center in the email and keep your logo relatively small. We are all enamored with our logos. We love our logos, but our audience really doesn't care. They just want to know who the email is from. So save the real estate on your email screen, make your logo smaller, make sure you include the company text in the email because if someone has not activated the images in your email, they won't know which company that email is coming from. Make sure the key action you want your reader to take is above the scroll line. 
don't give too many choices. People get hung up if they have too many choices in an email. So keep the choices limited and make all images clickable and with text labels. If you're not sure where to redirect someone who clicks on an image, send them to your website. And make sure that you test the email on yourself. Send it to yourself, look at it on your desktop, but most importantly, look at it on your mobile device and make sure it displays well. Next is best practice number eight, integrate your email campaign with your social campaign. Email and social media work together. If you look at the data from just a few years ago, in 2008, only 10% of small businesses and nonprofits were using social media marketing. And today, it's nearly 90%. Why is that? It's because you don't do things that don't work. And for small businesses that are seeing that social media works, that's what they're using today. It influences decisions. Social media works because it influences decisions. It's really become a primary driver of behavior. It influences purchasing. 74% of shoppers rely on social networks to guide purchase decisions. And we tend to share our purchases on social networks as well. When we go and buy something, whether it be on Amazon or eBay or someplace else, or maybe go to a restaurant, we're writing reviews, and people read those reviews, and people trust what's written by people that they know. And also, 68% learn more about a charity if they see a friend posting about it. So it works both in the for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. So that's why it's so important to shift your thinking. When you combine email with social media, the combination of both will increase the reach of your email campaigns that enjoy a 97% delivery rate, and it's actually even a bit higher with constant contact, but on average, 97% deliverability using email marketing is what you can rely upon. And sharing your email on social media gets in front of more people with potential to grow your list. And if you're doing it right, keeping it short, making the action or response obvious and simple, and providing access and information and real value, then you really will grow your business or nonprofit. So let's take a look at a couple of businesses that do that. This is a restaurant in uh, the Northeast called Boloco. It's a small, fast, casual burrito restaurant. And they use all these best practices that we covered. They have brand consistency across the platforms. They use great images and good social uh, subject lines. Here's the Girl Scouts of Northeast Texas, again, using email, social media, to really drive home their message. And here's an example of a services business and a franchise, Liberty Tax, and how they are leveraging both email and social media together. So again, you can see here brand consistency, great design, and they provide lots of helpful tips. Best practice number nine is expanding your campaign's reach. So how do you do that? Using these tools uh, makes it easy to push your email campaigns and events and surveys and offers out on multiple channels with just a few clicks. And another way to share is something called the social share bar which shows up at the top of emails to make it easy for readers to share your message with others. Part of that referral engine uh, that we uh, had addressed earlier, it's an electronic way to do word of mouth referral. And that of course is one of the most powerful ways to share your message. And don't forget, it's easy to make it easy for people to join your list. And there are some great tools that allow you to do that. If you have a brick and mortar operation at the cash register, if you're uh, in a restaurant with a check at the end of meals or on registration forms at a trade show, uh, if you're online only, or I hope you have a website, online web sign-up tools are perfect. Make sure you have a join our newsletter list on your website and on your Facebook page. And if you need help getting that done, give us a call. There are lots of other apps out there that can help you build your list. You can use QR codes for a scan to join. 
You can use text to join. They are both built into your Constant Contact account if you're using one already. And here are some other tools as well to help you expand your list. Best practice number 10, create a content calendar. It's easy to get hung up and try to remember all the things that you want to put out over the course of the week or month or even the days ahead. So really what you want to do is set up a calendar for yourself um, so that you can uh, have an organized way to push all of your content out. We talked about how to find the best day of the week and the best time of the day. So now what I want you to do is include a way to schedule your social media posts and to schedule your newsletter to go out. A couple of bonuses for you here. Best practice number 11, use autoresponders. And what they look like is something like this, where you can set up your account to where on days that you prescribe, you can have automated emails go out to your subscribers, to your email list. This is an example of an autoresponder that I've set up to send out emails automatically to people who have signed up for a free trial account. And you can see because these are free trials that the subscriber has requested, there's an incredibly high open rate and a very, very high click-through rate. Most of the emails that go out in this autoresponder of mine include a link to view a video or download an ebook or something of that nature. Some don't, and that's why the click rate may be a little bit lower on some of them than others. Best practice number 12, use marketing automation tools. What do I mean by that? And there's a great tool out there. One of our favorites is Hootsuite. And what Hootsuite allows you to do, as in this example, is allow you to schedule posts to go out at pre-designated times. You could schedule them to as many as you want to go out, and you could schedule them up to a year in advance. The basic Hootsuite application online is free. Again, if you need help, give us a call. We'll help guide you through it. So the bottom line on all of this is it seems like you're drinking from the ocean sometimes, but you really can do this. All you really need to do is just keep it simple. And so what's your next step? Well, your next step is take a look at a calendar of when we have additional marketing classes. Uh, we do these webinars uh, several times over the course of the month. I think we have another six that are scheduled between now and the end of July, and we're already beginning to schedule our August webinars. Webinars are free. This is the URL that you should go to to sign up for any of the upcoming classes. And also on that page, you'll see some of the other live on-site presentations that we do, and we also hold boot camps where you actually bring your laptop and uh, I say roll up your sleeves let's get to work and you log into your own account and we take you step by step on how to create a very effective email if you're not yet using an email marketing platform and I know that several of you on the call uh, are not uh, you can sign up for a free trial using the uh, link that I show in the upper left hand corner it's listed in red bit.ly slash free trial 2014 within one minute you can set up an email marketing account we can set it up for you if you just drop me an email I'd be happy to do that for you and then send in login send you the login information no salespeople will call you'll get a call from someone at constant contact that offers you a free 15 minute coaching trial uh, coaching uh, uh, class by the way and uh, we also offer free coaching as well if you sign up for uh, an email marketing account through our company, the Countess Group. Again, we are Constant Contact authorized experts. We are master certified by Constant Contact, so just about any question that you have about email marketing, we can handle for you. So if you need help on any of this, give us a call, drop us an email, Use the Ask a Question box right now in the upper left-hand corner of your screen or send an email to us at constantcontact at thecountessgroup.com. 
Um, if you're already using email marketing, uh, we have a VIP partner program. We have well over a thousand businesses and nonprofits that are members of our VIP program. It's free to join. There are no membership fees. We give free help. And we also will let you know when there are some new features coming that may be of value to you. And the reason that we do that for free is because if we provide some great service for you, we know that you'll refer us on to other people or companies that you know, and uh, that's just good business. It's word of mouth referral. Uh, here's an exclusive offer for you uh, as a thank you for attending today. We'll give you a free review of your most recent email. Just send me an email and I'll give you details of how that works. If you subscribe today, meaning if you get a new paid subscription today through us, we'll give you an hour of free coaching to help you get your first newsletter out. Again, that's for new subscriptions. And I want to thank you for attending. If you need a speaker for an upcoming event, uh, give us a call. We uh, were able to do events all over. Maybe you have a company that you'd like to sponsor an event and you'd like someone to come in and do a presentation on email or social media or what have you. In the uh, email that you'll get from me later in the day today as a thank you for attending today's event, you'll also get a um, a link to a catalog of all of the seminars we do. There are 22 different seminars that we do. And uh, also you'll get a link to our calendar as well. So again, if you'd like to attend one of our upcoming seminars or webinars, there is the link. It's bit.ly. That's one of the URL shorteners that are so common today. So bit.ly slash marketing classes and that will give you access to our um, uh, free seminars. Okay, uh, so we'll take some time out and take some questions. Uh, we'll keep the line open until about half past the hour. Happy to take time and answer whatever questions you may have. Again, here's a copy of our contact information. You'll get a copy of this uh, later in the day today. If you'd like to jot it down, that would be terrific too. What I would encourage you to do is to like us on all of our social media pages. Uh, Facebook, we have 9,000 likes on our page already. Our Twitter and Google Plus pages are growing rapidly. You can watch a few of our seminars and webinars on YouTube at youtube.com slash the Countess Group. So thank you again for attending. I'll stop here and I'll take questions. I see there are a couple already in the Q&A box. Again, if you'd like to ask a question uh, during the webinar, uh, click in the upper left-hand corner the Ask a Question button, and uh, I'll answer all the questions that I can. And give me a little feedback, if you would. If you enjoyed the webinar, go ahead and uh, use the meeting temperature uh, slide bar down at the bottom of your screen and, and just uh, give me a sense of how much you enjoyed the webinar. Okay. Uh, Carol asks, will I cover a CASL compliant sign-up forms with graphic examples of wording where to sign up on the home page? Um, that's something that uh, is best covered by someone uh, out of our Canadian operation. And if you check the Constant Contact website, you'll see uh, some webinars that specifically cover that. Uh, Marisol asks, where can I access Hootsuite? If you're interested in applying it to your business. Uh, the answer to that, Marisol, is um, if you go to Hootsuite.com, uh, you can go ahead and sign up for their uh, service. It's a free sign up, and they have some really great help as well. Any other questions? I'll stand by for a few minutes. Okay, not seeing any additional questions. I will go ahead and keep the line open. I want to thank everybody for attending today. 
and I look forward to having you attend one of our upcoming events. Have a great day.